Do you think he's running an overtly racist campaign for president? Well, I don't know what's in his heart, but I know what he's saying. Everybody says it, but I have a judge who is a hater of Donald Trump, a hater. So I think that was prejudice. Yeah, he's like Archie Bunker. That's a racist attack. I don't care if the judge is Mexican or not. They're yeah. not going to they be able to endorse a guy that makes racist statements. Why not talk about it for two minutes? Should I talk about it? Yes. You have to start calling him out and saying you're going to retract your endorsement of him today. He had ample opportunity over the weekend to retract to move away. Instead, he doubled down. That's a racist attack. Just a couple weeks ago, we were all talking about how the Republicans were all united and the Democrats were divided. Freedom prospers when religion is vibrant and the rule of law under God is acknowledged. An informed patriot is what we want. Welcome to American Family Radio's Focal Point, the home of muscular Christianity on conservative talk radio. Muscular Christianity. Where we relentlessly explore the intersection of truth and politics. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant. It's just that they know so much that isn't so. Now, here's your host, Brian Fisher. Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of Focal Point on American Family Radio. Brian Fisher is my name. Just want to share some of the thoughts, my thoughts about the situation with Donald Trump and the judge and the GOP. You know, I heard Steve Lonigan out there uh, in our conversation earlier talking about how Paul Ryan had a press conference this morning and had been very critical of Donald Trump again. So almost the entire Republican establishment now is united against Donald Trump, who is their own uh, candidate. So, uh, you know, this seems to me to be a, a web that the GOP has woven. Uh, my complaints here, I want to be very clear with our listening audience, my complaints here are not primarily with Donald Trump. Uh, I, I wouldn't have used the language that he used in talking about this judge. He's opened himself up to some criticism with the language that he's used. You can understand that. But I think what's gotten lost in the shuffle here is the possibility that Donald Trump has some genuine reasons to be concerned about the impartiality of this judge. Now, um, if you look at, and you're probably familiar with some of this, so I'm not going to rehearse this in any real detail, but I think there's questions to, there's reason to question the objectivity of Judge Gonzalo Curiel. In other words, what I'm saying is that Donald Trump, regardless of what you think about what he said or the way he said it, regardless of what you think about Trump University, and I've said before, I think he's got some serious problems there with Trump University, but that's what court cases are all about, and that's what will be addressed in in court. But this is a judge who has openly advocated for the advance of Latino causes. You know, before he joined the federal bench, he belonged to the San Diego La Raza Lawyers Association. You know, the word La Raza means the race in Spanish. So, I mean, this obviously creates a possibility that this organization may be as racially motivated as an organization that called itself the Aryan Lawyers Association. If you saw a lawyers association calling itself the Aryan Lawyers Association, I think that would raise some questions in your mind uh, about their ability to defend or represent a client who was a minority. Well, here you have something called the La Raza, the Race Lawyers Association. I think it's fair to ask a similar uh, question, at least to ask exploratory uh, questions particularly when you've got an organization that has has activated for has advocated for latino causes and Donald Trump is at least perceived to be somebody who is working against latino interests whether or not that's true that's not my point the point is that that's how Donald Trump is perceived he's perceived to be somebody who is hostile to latino interests now here is a judge he's going to be appearing before whose career prior to getting on the bench was to be involved with other legal types to promote Latino interest. So the possibility of some kind of conflict of interest, I think, obviously uh, exists. You know, and Judge Curiel, when he was working with the La Raza Lawyers Association, he participated in a committee that awarded scholarships to illegal aliens. 
So I want you to think about that just for uh, a second. So here is Judge Curiel. He is publicly rewarding those who have no right even to be in this country. He's rewarding those who are breaking the law just by standing in front of those attorneys to receive an award and just by being present at an award ceremony like that, they were breaking um, the law. So, you know, you have to wonder uh, uh, about their objectivity when it comes to issues that deal with immigration uh, and the border and border security. Uh, And, of course, it has nothing to do with the Trump University case, but this is obviously what Donald Trump is associated with. He's backing away from his uh, intention to suspend Muslim immigration. He says that's just a suggestion. He's asked about working with Paul Ryan, says, I believe we're going to, we're going to find a way to compromise. We're going to get something done through compromise. We'll find a way to work together. You know, and yet the one thing he's not retreated on, is not backed down on, is building the wall. At least publicly he's not done that. So here is a, here's a judge who's actively advocated for and worked for the promotion, the rewarding of illegal aliens and illegal uh, immigration. You know, they've got a number of organizations on their homepage that are – dedicated their affiliate organizations under their community section. These are organizations that are dedicated to promoting amnesty and illegal immigration. And they're on the home page of the organization that this judge belonged to when he was still a practicing attorney. So I think you have to ask yourself the question and see the GOP hasn't stopped to do this. They haven't stopped to ask themselves the question of whether Donald Trump has a legitimate beef here. Uh, But I think an objective observer would be compelled to say, look, there are questions about whether this judge could be neutral and could be objective and could be impartial when he's got a plaintiff before him who's basically claimed to notoriety and fame is that he's going to enforce immigration law and he's going to deport the same students that Judge Curiel wants to send to college. I mean, that's got to raise questions in people's minds. You know, it's it's odd and, and hypocritical, in my view, for the left to criticize Trump for bringing up the ethnicity of Judge Curiel. Everybody's saying, can't do that, shouldn't do it, shouldn't bring up the ethnicity of the judge. That's wrong. Uh, but what does the left constantly do? They are all the time bleeding uh, and moaning and clamoring for diversity on the bench. So they're out there at the same time saying ethnicity is important on the bench. Uh, and remember, that they, they were just all agog, uh, went gaga over Sonia Sotomayor because they considered her to be a wise Latina. That was actually Sonia Sotomayor's own description of herself, a wise Latina who would make a better decision, a better ruling than an old white guy. And the left thought that this was fine. Uh, so they were celebrating ethnicity in a judge when it came to Sonia Sotomayor. Here's what one observer said. When Sonia Sotomayor said that being, quote, a wise Latina influences her decisions for the better, that, we were told, was not merely nothing to worry about, but a sign of her judicial temperament and fitness for the high court. When Trump says being a Latino will influence this judge's hearing of his case, he's Adolf Hitler. But remember, Justice is supposed to be utterly impartial. That's why Lady Justice wears a blindfold. Because before the bar of justice, it should not matter the ethnicity of the judge, the ethnicity of the plaintiffs, the ethnicity of the defendants, the ethnicity of the jurors, because the issue is one of criminal behavior and not uh, heritage. But realize now, this is where I lay some of the fault at the feet of the left, if they continue to insist on ethnic diversity, then what they do is they more and more make race rather than justice the issue in our legal system. Now, Bill O'Reilly last night called for the recusal of this judge, and I think that would be entirely right and appropriate. I think there are clearly reasons for objective observers to wonder whether he can be impartial. And in that case, when there's any legitimate question, the federal law says If there's even a reasonable question about impartiality, the judge has a moral and ethical duty to recuse himself. Focal Point, American Family Radio.
In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-711-8221. Again, 800-711-8221. That's 800-711-8221. 800-711-8221. Did you know that diabetes is the leading cause of new blindness, kidney failure, and 60% of all non-traumatic lower limb amputations? Are you waiting for one of these to occur before you take action? Attack the problem now and naturally with no BDs. I'm a type 1 diabetic, meaning I'm insulin dependent. Um, when I started taking no BDs, my blood sugar levels were up to 285. Um, after only one day of taking no BDs, my blood sugar dropped to 115. Now, I know it seems unbelievable, and quite frankly, when I looked down at my glucometer, I was surprised at what I was seeing as well. And to anyone who's skeptical about no BDs, I would tell you that it's a natural product, it works. My blood sugar was at 549. And in a short period of time, I've dropped down to 84 to 88 and a half, and I have the blood test to prove it. Get two bottles free. Just pay processing and handling. No BDs. It could change your life forever. Do it or call 1-800-329-2988. This is Focal Point with Brian Fisher on American Family Radio. Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of Focal Point on American Family uh, Radio. Let's grab a couple of sound bites uh, that uh, touch on what we've been talking about over the course of this first uh, segment. Uh, let's grab clip number two. This is Donald Trump talking about the, uh, the judge. Uh, you know, and again, uh, I came across a quote from Sonia Sotomayor. Let me see if I can find that exact quote where she said um, ethnicity, quote, will make a difference in our judging. So that's the wise Latina, Sonia Sotomayor. Ethnicity, quote, will make a difference in our judging. Now, how is that any different than what Donald Trump is saying? He's saying exactly what Sonia Sotomayor is saying, that the ethnicity of the judge will make a difference in the way he judges. Now, anyway, here is Donald Trump, clip number two, and th this is a firestorm like you've never seen before, and I don't remember anything like this just flaring up this quickly. I mean, it's a consuming conflagration where you got the entire GOP establishment running, campaigning against their own candidate, against their own standard. I don't ever remember seeing anything quite this uh, dramatic. But here's Donald Trump on Bill O'Reilly's program last night. And remember, Bill O'Reilly called, uh, we'll play that clip here in just a second, so I'll save that. But here's Donald Trump on with Bill O'Reilly talking about what he wants out of this judge clip too. I want him to be just, all I want him to do is give me a fair shake. When we have thousands of people saying I the courses it, are right. great, well, why we'll does this thing happens. continue to go forward? Believe me, nothing okay, in this case you. is going to go on, on <clears throat> unchallenged, that's for sure, on both sides. Always good to see you. Bill, Thank I you for taking the time. I want to focus on the economy. I want to focus on the military. I want to focus on things that we need to focus on, not a civil lawsuit that I'm going to end up winning anyway. All right. So uh, Donald Trump saying, you know, all I want is for this judge to be a fair guy. I don't know that anybody that's facing a court of law doesn't want that in a uh, judge. Now, clip number three, this is Bill O'Reilly, same program last night, talking about the judge, and here's his view of what ought to happen with Judge Curiel. And by the way, Judge Curiel, uh, just to give you the complete backstory, in his defense, he is hard enough as a judge on the drug cartels that there was basically a contract out on his life for a time. 
He actually lived in fear for his life because of the drug cartels and some of the rulings that he made that were designed to interrupt the traffic of drugs. Anyway, here is what Bill O'Reilly said. Although appointed by Barack Obama, Judge Carell is no raging liberal. In fact, he's a tough guy. At one point, a Mexican drug cartel threatened to assassinate him because of his anti-drug trafficking stance. However, the judge belongs to a group called San Diego La Raza Lawyers Association, which does advocacy work on behalf of Latinos. It's not associated with the radical La Raza group, but confusion is understandable. Because of that, Mr. Trump apparently believes the judge may be biased against him. As it is well known, the candidate has taken a strong stand against illegal immigration, including building a border wall. Summing up, the Trump U case is certainly political to some extent, and it's a very high profile situation. Because of that, Talking Points believes the judge should recuse himself. Not because he did anything wrong, he didn't, but to eliminate any doubt as to the motivation in court rulings. There are plenty of federal judges that could immediately step in. It is valid that some may see any recusal as caving to intimidation, but stark justice in a case this important trumps, pardon the pun, any theoretical argument. All right, so Bill O'Reilly is saying, look, uh, I think this judge ought to recuse himself because it, everything just looks bad. Here's what the United States Code says. This is section, uh, Title 18, Section 455. Any justice judge or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding, listen to this, in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. In any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. In other words, if an objective observer looks at that situation and has reason to believe that there is a question about impartiality, then it's incumbent upon a judge to recuse himself in that case. So I think Bill O'Reilly in this case is uh, correct. Now, one last uh, clip, clip number four. You know, this is this is Tammy Bruce. She is a lesbian, but she's a conservative on political and economic uh, issues. And she said, look, here is the, uh, the reality about the low information media with any conservative. It doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Donald Trump, whether it's Mother Teresa, whether it is Ted Cruz, it doesn't matter. This is part of their playbook, clip four. This is going to always be one of the issues. I've said this, uh, we all know this forever, that the media is going to go after the GOP nominee no matter who it is. The media is going to go after the GOP no matter who it is and call him a racist just the way that they uh, do things there. Now, speaking of the media, uh, it, you know, there's questions about what Facebook is doing. We've even had some internal questions in the AFR family about what may or may not uh, be being done to Facebook pages and other social media pages, whether it's some kind of restriction, some kind of filtering, some kind of channeling, some kind of restriction in the flow uh, there. But, you know, you, you read about this crackdown and the part of the European Union with Twitter involved, Google's involved, Microsoft's involved, Facebook's involved, and they're going to clamp down on hate speech within 24 hours. Within 24 hours, they are going to clamp down on hate speech. And they've made good on that. They actually went after a website that told the truth about Islam. I'll see if I can find that story. But this is a woman, writes for Gatestone Institute, a perfectly reputable website exploring all things Islam. And she simply told the truth about Islam. I don't remember what specific aspect of Islam she told the truth about, but they pulled her entire page down. Her whole Facebook page was pulled down. And there was enough outcry that she got it put back up. But the point is they took it down. And they're pledged to intervene immediately and here's their stand. This is from an official document from the European Union. This is the kind of speech that they are determined how to wipe out in all of Europe. Hate speech is sweepingly defined as, quote, this is what's from the document, as disrespectful public discourse about any group. 
That's the definition of hate speech now in the European Union, disrespectful public discourse about any group. You know, that's basically no different. We've been complaining about this since day one. Disagreement, ladies and gentlemen, is not hate speech. The truth is not hate. The truth is not hate speech. But rapidly, it's becoming so for the left, where if you tell the truth now about anything or anybody that the left disagrees with, you get tagged as a hater. Whatever you said gets tagged as hate speech, and Facebook is going to go after you and pull your page completely down. Uh, Speaking of uh, bias, you know, I've got an article here about seven times that liberals were overtly racists when they talked about judges before Trump came along. Seven different examples. This from the Daily Caller News Foundation. Uh, We mentioned already Justice Sonia Sotomayor. They were just gaga over her being a wise Latina who would reach, quote, a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life, end quote. Uh, When Donald Trump released his list of Supreme Court justices, the low-information media was quick to criticize his list because everybody on it was white. So they jumped to ethnicity right off the bat. Before they looked about qualifications, history, experience, acumen, it was all about race. Uh, George Take from the Star Trek actor, he called Justice Clarence Thomas a clown in blackface when he ruled against same-sex marriage, again, lurching to ethnicity. Anna Quindlin, liberal writer for Newsweek, also invoked Clarence Thomas's race. She said he was chosen because he was conservative and black, an affirmative action hire by the administration. Seattle Times, similar deal, calling Clarence Thomas a beneficiary of affirmative action programs. And the White House was had to defend itself because their nominee, Merrick Garland for the Supreme Court, was an old white guy. So they had to go into hyperdrive to defend their diversity record in judicial appointments. So the left just consumed, not with the idea of merit, not with the idea of justice, but with the idea of race. Now here's uh, one thing I want to touch on briefly before we get to the the end of the segment. Um... By the way, BuzzFeed, you might be familiar with BuzzFeed. It is a news site on the left. Uh, I was a subject of a BuzzFeed profile back in 2012, uh, I think, extended uh, profile. And they're they're hardcore left. But they made a decision this week that they were going to turn down $1.3 million from Donald Trump. He wanted to advertise on BuzzFeed, wanted to run political ads on BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed said no. We don't want your money on grounds of principle. We don't support what you stand for. We don't believe in your agenda. We don't want to give you any help. So we are not even going to take $1.3 million for you to put your ads on our website. And everybody's praising them. The left is praising them for being so principled. Let me ask you this question. What's the difference between turning down $1.3 million on principle and turning down a pro sodomy wedding cake on principle and turning down the money. I mean, maybe a cake is what a couple hundred bucks. I don't know what wedding cakes go for these days, but let's say a wedding cake costs you two, 300 bucks to have it done. uh, Right. I don't know. I'm just guessing there, but how is it okay to turn down $1.3 million on the grounds of principle and you get praised for it, but you turn down 300 bucks on the grounds of principle and you lose your shirt. Where is the justice and the equity and all of that? Now, here's another part of the low information media that that you or the, uh, here's another fact that you will not hear from the low information media. And I talked earlier about Muhammad Ali and how he had a private conversation with Billy Graham, who shared the gospel with him. And apparently, uh, Muhammad Ali continued in his Islamic faith, never converted back to his original Christian faith of his youth. But here's something, you know, and, and and the media all week has been filled with stories about Muhammad Ali. Laudatory encomiums, flashbacks. Uh, nobody can say enough wonderful, great things about Muhammad Ali and his career. But here's something they will not tell you when they talk about how brave he was, the kind of risks that he took. Will we ever see an, an athlete activist like him again? What they will not tell you 
is that Muhammad Ali endorsed Ronald Reagan. Ask how many times you've heard that in the low information media. Muhammad Ali endorsed Ronald Reagan. Be right back. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? Hi, I'm George Foreman. People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can provide patent referrals and submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee your company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. For your free inventor's information, call 1-800-441-7922. That's 1-800-441-7922. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-711-8221. Again, 800-711-8221. That's 800-711-8221. 800-711-8221. American Family Radio. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Video segments of today's program will be posted at AFR.net and on the Focal Point Facebook page. You'll also find the best collection of Brian's resources on our Facebook page. If you're on Twitter, be among the very first every morning to find out what the day's show will be about. Just follow Brian at Brian J. Fisher. Brian J. Fisher. Hi, welcome back to Focal Point American Family Radio. No, we talked yesterday. Brian Fisher is my name, by the way, and you're listening to Focal Point on American Family Radio. Reminder, if you're listening on radio, you want another way to access the content. We're live streaming on Facebook now, uh, one hour at a time. So we have two video segments posted on the Facebook page. Immediately after they're recorded, they're posted. We've got a table of content so you can see what's in each hour and where to find it. If there's a topic there you're particularly interested in, uh, we'll show you right where to find it on the table of contents. One of the things we talked about yesterday was war and what good is war and what's the purpose of war. came across a quote from an English philosopher and political economist, John Stuart Mill. This is from 1862. Here's what he said. This is 1862, middle of the Civil War now. War is an ugly thing, but not the ugliest of things. The decayed and degraded state of moral and patriotic feeling, which thinks that nothing is worth a war, is much worse. Now he says some wars certainly can be bad, but a war to protect other human beings against tyrannical injustice, a war to give victory to their own ideas of right and good, and which is their own war carried on for an honest purpose by their free choice, is often the means of their regeneration. A man who has nothing which he is willing to fight for, nothing which he cares about more than he does about his personal safety, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. As long as justice and injustice have not terminated, their ever-renewing fight for ascendancy in the affairs of mankind Human beings must be willing, when need is, to do battle for the one against the other. You know, here's a little story from the TSA. This is from a personal a blog post. But, you know, I've encouraged you to go to the AFA 
Net website and sign our uh, target petition boycott. 1.3 million signatures and rising. We're setting a goal over the next couple of weeks to add 50 to 60,000 signatures to that petition. I want to urge you to go there right now. If you haven't signed it, go there right now and sign it. Uh, send it to your friends. The link, encourage them uh, to sign it. Uh, th- you know, th- this transgender thing is getting completely out of control. Let me give you an example of how far this is reaching into our culture. We brought you that story from Alaska, I think on Monday. What is today, Tuesday? Yeah, so that was yesterday. About the guy, the transvestite, that they allowed to compete in the girls' track and field championships. Came away with a bronze medal as a transvestite running in the girls' competition. Now, here's a story that will curl your hair. Uh, This is uh, a first-hand experience. A friend of mine told, well, except for Rob. Nothing's going to curl Rob's hair, but... A friend of mine told me about her recent experience in an airport security line. She was dutifully passing through the metal detector when she heard a beep and was told she would need the pat-down procedure. It is the right of the traveler to have that procedure performed by someone of the same gender or the same sex. And so, as per protocol... The call went out for a female officer to assist. But as the pat-down began, my friend realized that the officer was undeniably biologically male, though identifying as female. She did not know what to do or say, so simply allowed the pat-down to proceed As she walked away, she realized that she was more surprised than offended. It had never occurred to her that she might unexpectedly find herself being frisked by a man whom she had been told was a woman. So the bottom line is you have transvestites now that are patting down your wives and daughters at the airport working for TSA, and they're patting down the females in our family. So you don't think this issue is something that's worth fighting. It's way bigger than bathrooms. It's way bigger than Target. It's even bigger than the TSA. Uh, so uh, that, you know that's the extent to which things have declined now on that entire topic. Uh, let's see what else we want to touch on today. Let me take a look at my stack here and see what we want to talk about. A couple of other uh, interesting stories. These are kind of more uplifting stories as we make our way to our phone call segment. In fact, we'll give the number now if you want to jump in the queue early. 888-589-8840 is the number. 888-589-8840. And these are kind of two winnable war moments I want to bring your way uh, as we close uh, this segment out. The first one is uh, from 1967. We are right now in the middle of the period that occupied what we know of as the Six-Day War. This was the six days between June 5th until June 10th of 1967. And these are days, as this article in front of me, this is an article written by a 25-year veteran of the Israeli Defense Forces, protecting his identity, but appeared on American Thinker. The six days between June 5th and June 10th, 1967, are without parallel in the story of human warfare. These six days are also without parable, a parallel as far as modern-day miracles are concerned as well. Prior to 1967, who had ever heard of a full-scale war that was measured in days. Think World War II. For our part, 1941 to 1945, four years it took us to defeat the Axis powers. Think about the Civil War. 1861 to 1865, it took four years for that uh, that war to be settled. Think of the Revolutionary War. 1776 to 1783 took seven years to settle the issue. Here was a full-scale war involving six nations that lasted six days. 
This guy says, who ever heard of such a thing? And he uses the word miracles here. He'll use them again. Now, this is a war that began at 745 on Monday morning and was over dramatically on Saturday of the same week. This was a war in which one tiny country, Israel, faced five hostile Arab countries, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, with assistance from Iraq and Lebanon, and with a combined military might, twice the number of soldiers, three times the amount of tanks, and four times the amount of fighter aircraft. Egypt and Syria military forces were trained by leading Soviet military advisors and armed with the most sophisticated weaponry in the Soviet arsenal. Some experts estimated that the expected Israeli death toll would be as high as 100,000 casualties. You know what the total happened to be? 800 Israelis killed in action. Uh, Israel liberated and united the city of Jerusalem. If you go today to the Western Wall, that was not back in Jewish hands until June 10th of 1967. That's why that is such a special place for the Jewish people today. They were prevented from even accessing the Temple Mount or the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, until the Six-Day uh, War. One of the famous photographs from that war is of an Israeli commander kissing the, uh, the Wailing Wall, kissing the Western Wall, because a Jew had not been able to do that in uh, decades. Here's a couple of the details. Eitzer Weizmann, who had built the Israeli Air Force and was head of operations during the war, was asked to explain the astounding success of the Air Force on the first day of the war. What happened on the first day of the war, almost all of the planes in the Israeli Air Force, 200 of them, set out to attack the Egyptian Air Force, its planes, and its airfields. Listen to this. They only kept 12 fighter jets behind to patrol the open skies of all of Israel to protect the heart of the country. The other 200 were sent to Egypt and to the Egyptian airfields. Egypt had a well-developed, advanced anti-aircraft arsenal boasting dozens of missiles, hundreds of cannons, generously again supplied by the Soviet Union. In contrast, most of the Israeli planes were old French models. Now, here's this. Had the Israeli attacking force been detected on their way before the attack, they easily would have been knocked out of the air because Egypt had very sophisticated detection and anti-aircraft defense devices. It was precisely then that the great miracle occurred. All of the aircraft reached the Egyptian airfields in Sinai along the Suez Canal and the Nile River without even one being detected. This is 200 airplanes flying through hostile airspace with sophisticated detection systems and anti-aircraft uh, weapons, and all 200 airplanes went through completely undetected. The entire Egyptian anti-aircraft batteries lined all along the border perimeters of Egypt, did not function. Divine Providence linked arms with the brave Israeli pilots. They flew in total silence at an altitude of 80 feet above the sea with precision and operation discipline. At exactly 745, the Israeli planes hovered over the Egyptian airfields and bombed the runways, putting the Egyptian Air Force out of action Within one hour, more than 200 Egyptian planes had been destroyed. All of Egypt's military runways were bombed, preventing any remaining Egyptian planes from taking off and turning those fighters into sitting ducks. Here's what General Moti Hod, the head of the IAF at the time, was quoted as saying, quote, even in my wildest dreams, I could not have imagined such an achievement. And he added this, who can express the power of God or tell his praise? That's Psalm 106, verse 2. After three hours, three hours after the start of Operation Moked, the war had been won. 300 Egyptian planes had been destroyed and all the airfields had been disabled. The Egyptians falsely announced a great victory. So Jordan, Syria, and Iraq rushed into the battlefield right into the jaws of death and they too were wiped out. 
Here's what H. Air Weitzman said, who built the Israeli Air Force, head of operations during the war. He said this uh, when he was asked to explain the success on day one. It is the finger of God. That's exactly what Pharaoh said when Israel defeated him in the Exodus. It is the finger of God. Back in two. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? Hi, I'm George Foreman. People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can provide patent referrals and submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee your company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. For your free inventor's information, call 1-800-441-7922. That's 1-800-441-7922. You on the phone. Some valley tells me that you're not at home. Unchain my heart. Step to free. In these uncertain economic times, you've got to do whatever you can to save money. One of our biggest expenses can be our cars, especially when unexpected repair bills hit. Not anymore. If you own a vehicle with less than 130,000 miles, is less than 12 years old, has a warranty about to expire, or even no warranty at all, you could stop paying for car repairs. Roadside assistance, towing, and rental coverage are all included. Don't wait for the next repair. Make one free call right now to see if you qualify. If your vehicle is less than 12 years old, has less than 130,000 miles, even if it's out of warranty, paying for car repairs can become a thing of the past. Call us right now and get your car protected before your next repair bill hits. Get protection and no more repair bills. Call 800-711-8221. Again, 800-711-8221. That's 800-711-8221. 800-711-8221. You're listening to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Focal Point, Brian Fisher. Hi, and welcome back to this last segment of Focal Point on American Family Radio. Number to call if you want to join the conversation, 888-589-8840, 888-589-8840. You know, we've talked with you before about the minimum wage, increasing the minimum wage. And the reason that I am opposed to the minimum wage is that I care about low-skilled workers. I want low-skilled workers who were just starting out, I want them to be able to get a job, to get a decent job, to get an honest job, to be able to work with their own hands and generate an income. The problem with minimum wage hikes that are artificial is they put young, unskilled workers out of a job. Here's a story from D.C. that nearly half of the employers in what, boy, you talk about a place that needs jobs for low skilled and undereducated workers. It's Washington, D.C. Half, nearly half of D.C. employers have said they have either laid off employees or reduced their hours to adapt to D.C.'s minimum wage hikes since 2014. Nearly half of the employers in Washington, D.C. Minimum wage hikes are lethal to the people who need jobs the most. So these liberals are out there. They're, they're all about compassion. We want to give the low income a raise. We want to give them a living wage. Therefore, we are going to artificially impose an increase in the minimum wage. And all they do is put the people they claim to care about out of work. So I would suggest that the people that want to get rid of minimum wage laws from an intelligence standpoint, we are showing the most compassion and the most care because we are getting rid of the obstacles imposed by liberals that keep them from, me, from being able to get starter set jobs. All right, let's go to the phones. Let's start with Mac in Albany, Georgia. Mac uh, in Albany, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Hey, thank you, Brian. How you doing? Good. How are you? 
I'm doing good. I was just want to mention about the, right quick Muhammad Ali. He was a terrific fighter. But then ref, but then respect. I've got to mention Rocky Marciano. He was the only world heavyweight undefeated retired champion. Well, and you're and exact- they, no one ever mentions Rocky. I listen to every one of his fights because back when at that time it was kind of like football, you know. But when he hit Georgia Joe Walcott, it put a picture on the Ring magazine, the front cover. If you could ever see that picture, when he hit him, it just showed his glove and his face, the sweat off of him, and where his jaw went, and the glove how it smashed in and and, and and moved over to one side. Rocky had a lick that no other man ever had. That's and that I thank you, brother. All right, Mac. You know, and he's right. Rocky Marciano retired at forty nine and zero, never lost a single bout, retired undefeated, forty nine and zero as a heavyweight uh, boxer. You know, I just thought of a a story, a Muhammad Ali story from my youth. I broke my wrist in a gymnastics class in middle school, junior high. We called it then. And I had to have, I mean, my my right wrist, it just like buckled up. And so I had to get it splitted so they could take me to the doctor. And the the what he used to put a splint for my wrist, my gym coach, was a 1965 Sports Illustrated edition <laughs> that had a picture of Muhammad Ali yeah. standing over, I think, Sonny Liston, you know, with his glove and <laughs> Liston's lying flat yeah. on the canvas. Mm-hmm. And that was the splint for my broken wrist. Hmm. So I got a little Muhammad Ali story of my yeah. own. So. I have a little one. What's your Muhammad Ali story? I actually was first hired at Caesars Palace because of the Ali Foreman fight. They ah. built a ring right out in the parking lot, and they needed extra people to help out. And they hired me and kept me ever since. And the rest is history. Yeah. So. All right. Now, Jeff was going to go on to say, and they wanted me to serve as a sparring partner Muhammad Ali, and so I did. I was pretty now, scrawny. We, we, would have, we would have no way not to verify I that. I would have so. ended up with a Sports Illustrated splint <laughs> somewhere. Around your head. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go to Jack in Dallas, Texas. Uh, Jack, welcome to Focal Point with yes, Brian sir. Fisher. What's on your mind? Um, I wanted to call regarding the Trump issue. Yes, sir. You know, it seems like uh, the, the, uh, the Republicans – all jumped on him, and they did, They were misquoting him just like the other media was. They didn't. It seems like they didn't even hear what he said about this judge being a member of La Raza and him wanting to build a border. They totally ignored that and jumped right to him being a racist. And it's weird how uh, you know anyone other than a white person can join a racist group. Uh, and and they're not a racist, but if a white person even starts to mention that there may be some discrimination involved regarding racism, then uh, <laughs> everything breaks loose there. Well, you know, I think you got a good point, Jack, and I appreciate your phone call. And you know, that's you know, and, and I think as I t- I touched on this yesterday, but I think the reality is that the Republicans they they are so spineless the GOP establishment, and so petrified. They are petrified at being called a racist because they know that's the worst thing that you can be called. It's the worst thing you can be tagged with. I mean, one of the things that Rachel Maddow beat me up with on her campaign against me a year and a half ago or so was that I was a racist, that I'd said things that were racist. I had said nothing of the sort. Misquoted, taken out of context, didn't matter. She just repeated it mindlessly. People believed it. And once you get tagged as a racist, trust me on this, once you get tagged as a racist, you never get that off of you. You never get that label off of you because every time your name pops up, they slap it on you uh, one more time. And so the, the Republican Party, they know that. They know that the left is vicious. They're mean-spirited. They're unfair. Uh, they will falsely accuse you of racism because they know it can neutralize you. If they can get people to believe that you're a racist, doesn't even matter whether it's true or not. They can neutralize you. They can marginalize you. And they can silence you. And, and and the Republican Party is just petrified. They won't stand up against those false accusations. They won't defend somebody who gets tagged with these false accusations uh, of racism. And it's obviously working 
for the low information media. They've got the entire GOP establishment now, the entire party on one side of the equation, along with the Democrats on the other side, Donald Trump standing by himself. And, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen with all of this. I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty critical moment for the GOP. I think for the GOP, for Donald Trump's base, not the GOP base, but for Donald Trump's base, it isn't going to hurt him with the base. It's just more of an example that he's the kind of non politically correct guy that we need to get behind. I don't think it's going to hurt him. Let's go to Rowell or Rowell in Richardson, Texas. Welcome. What's on your mind? Uh, two things. First of all, you know how you, how you can tell you're winning an argument, don't you? How's that? They, they all of a sudden they call you racist. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, you know, that is the first sign of a man without an argument is name-calling. That is the first place they go as soon as they run out of facts, information, logic, history. That's where they go. They flash to name-calling. It's the sign that they've lost the argument on the grounds of reason and rationality. Is exactly right, Roll. Anyway, go ahead. The gentleman I used to work for was Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force and was an advisor during the Six-Day War. And the Egyptians had uh, built uh, plywood mock-ups that looked almost identical to their fighters, to their MiG fighters. Uh -huh. And they had them placed out on the uh, tarmac. And it's funny, when the Israelis came in and bombed the, uh, the fighters sitting on the, the MiG fighters sitting on the tarmac, the ones they didn't bomb were the plywood ones. Huh. So, uh, and, and what's the explanation for that? Intelligence. What's that? Intelligence. The intelligence. Oh, oh so they, they were just smart enough to be able to tell which ones were and which ones weren't and didn't take out the ones that didn't need to be taken out. Didn't waste the bombs. Didn't no reason to waste the ammo. Well, so. you know, that was an amazing thing. You know, we just read the fact that that war was over in about three hours. I mean, the bombing raids in the Egyptian airfields completely neutralized the Egyptian Air Force. 300 Egyptian planes bombed out of commission or runways torn up. They couldn't take off, couldn't land. So over almost before the thing started. All right, Roll, thank you for the call. I appreciate that. That'd be kind of hard to fly, uh, fly a a plywood fighter plane, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. so, you know, it kind of reminds you of what uh, you know what Eisenhower did in World War II with that yeah. mock army. He even had Patton up there yeah. in the northern part of England there, you know, across from Pas de Calais up there with a whole fake right, right. tanks and mm -hmm. trucks and planes Airplanes and everything. And, everything. Yeah. and they had Patton there because that sold them on the, you know, it's like you put your best running back in motion. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's going to draw some. Uh, that's going to draw some attention. Yeah, that's what they did on D-Day, right? Yeah. All right, let's go to Jerry in Conroe, Texas. Jerry, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Hello, Mr. Bishop. Thank you for taking my call, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is Senator Cruz's chance at the convention to become president? Okay, well, that's an interesting question, Jerry, and I appreciate your call. Thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we chat touched on this a little bit earlier in the first hour. There is a remote chance that the convention could go to a, it's not actually a brokered convention, but an open convention. It's very remote. Again, I think it would be a desperation attempt. I'm sure, I'll, I will guarantee you that people in the GOP establishment, they, they're in a complete panic right now over this Donald Trump thing with the judge. I mean, they don't know what to do. I mean, they're they're in complete meltdown panic mode over how they handle this because the entire world now is landing on them as a party of racists and landing on their candidate as a racist. What are they going to do? One possibility is that they could change the rules of the convention and allow for delegates to be unbound unbound on the first ballot. Right now, according to the rules, most of those delegates are obligated to vote for the candidate that won their primaries. If they unbound the delegates, it's possible that Ted Cruz has more delegates pledged to him than there are pledged to Donald Trump, and Ted Cruz could even win an open convention. See you right back here tomorrow, Focal Point, American Family Radio. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of the American Family Association or American Family Radio. 
American Family Radio.